Hey everyone, this is the Oracle specific guide for CloudBlock. We'll get started. Be at the CloudBlock GitHub page, scroll to the top and find the OCI or Oracle Cloud Infrastructure folder, and then scroll down to the instructions. We're going to skip through the beginning. You'll have done that in the first half of this step-by-step uh, -step guide in the previous video. You will need an Oracle account. Scroll down to the Oracle CLI instructions. The first thing we need to do is open PowerShell and start Windows Subsystem Linux. I'll find PowerShell, type in WSL, and then we need to CD to our home directory. Download the Oracle CLI installer. I'll grab that. It's a long command, make sure you grab the whole thing. And then to paste in PowerShell, right click. I'll scroll back over and we'll run the installer you may be prompted for your password while this runs. There's my prompt. This is the password that you created just moments ago in the previous video for Windows Subsystem Linux. I'm going to give this a little bit to run and I'll be back when it's done. Okay, the Oracle CLI has been installed. We need to refresh our environment. Now we'll copy our user OCID from the Oracle Web Console. Navigate to Identity, and then Users, find your user, and copy the OCID. We'll also need the Tenancy OCID. I'll show you where you enter those. So I'll go down to this next command here. Grab the OCID. Now it's asking me for the configuration location. The default is fine. I'll hit enter. Now it asks me for my user OCID. I've copied that and pasted it in. Paste with a right click in PowerShell. And now it's asking me for my tenancy ID. And that is in profile, which is the top right, and then tenancy. So I'll click my profile and then tenancy. Copy the OCID hit enter. It also asked me for a region. Do a quick search for which region works best for you. I'm in the U.S. on the East Coast and I'll pick U.S. Ashburn 1. Do we want to generate a new API signing key? Yes, that's fine. I'll hit enter. And where do I want that stored? The default is great. The key name is fine. No passphrase is needed. I've just hit enter throughout. We need to copy the contents of the key that was generated. Make sure you highlight all the way down to that last dash. And then we're going to add it. So we need to navigate to identity users. That's identity users. Your user. Scroll down to API keys and add a public key. We'll hit paste and then paste the key in. I'll hit add. We need to note for a future step, the location of our file. There it is. And also note the output of our OCID for the root compartment. Grab this long command, paste it, and we'll need this value as well. And it's a good test to see if the previous steps worked. And there we go, it worked. All right, let's customize our deployment. We'll CD into the CloudBlock OCI subdirectory. And we'll do the same thing in File Explorer. Uh, you'll note here that I've got Chad in the path of the file or directory location. You'll need to change that to the path, or I'm sorry, to the name of your Windows Subsystem Linux user. If you don't know what that is, type in who am I and you'll get the response. There's mine, it's Chad. So I'll copy this, open File Explorer, and paste in the address. The file that we're editing is oci.tfvars. Double click it. It may prompt you for an application to open it in. Choose Notepad, that's fine. I've already done so. I'm gonna scroll down to the variable section and we can look over these. So ph password, that's the very first one. That's the password to access the PyHole web UI. Make sure this is something um, unique and strong, but I'm gonna make it simple for this tutorial. I'll set it to change me one. We also need our SSH key. We generated that in the last video. Copy that, command, P 
paste it in and I can see my key. You don't need this last little bit. You can keep it. There's no problem doing so, but I don't need it. I'm going to highlight and then right click, go back to notepad and then in between the quotes, I'll remove the old and paste the new. Management Cider is next. What is that? That's the IP range that is granted web UI access to the pie hole, uh, SSH access to the instance. And then if the variable DNS underscore no VPN is equal to one, which is the default, it's also granted direct access to the pie hole for DNS without using WireGuard. If you're deploying from home, this should be your public IP address with the slash 32 suffix. Don't know what your public IP address is, that's okay. Google can tell you. What is my IP? There's mine, I'll copy that. And paste it in, leave the slash 32. Next we need the OCI config profile and root compartment. Those are the two values that we saw earlier. So there's my profile. I'll copy that, paste it in. It's already set because my name's Chad. And then the root compartment OCID, that was this value. Those are all the settings we must change, but let's look over some of the others. Next is WireGuard peers. This is the number of VPN configurations that WireGuard will generate for us. This should be at least um, the number of devices that you have, but there's no harm. Uh, the default is 20 and there's no harm having more than you need. So for example, if you had two cell phones and a laptop, you'd need at least three. Um, I think the upper limit is somewhere around 250. Next is Doe Provider. This is your DNS over HTTPS provider. Your DNS lookups need to go somewhere. If we look at the diagram, you'll see this cloud over here on the right. This is the variable that we're setting right now. Open DNS is fine for me. It works great. I've had reliable service. There are several to choose from. Do some research on wh what might work best for you. Um, a lot of these have different levels of security involved or openness about how they pr uh, provide their DNS service. It's definitely good to do some research. Another one we can look at is VPN traffic. It's sent to DNS by default. So if we look at that diagram again, this cloud is handling your DNS traffic, right? So if you've got your device connected to WireGuard, um, it will all the normal traffic like browsing, streaming, that goes through your internet service provider. Let's say you're on your cell phone, you're on a mobile network, you're, you watch a YouTube video, that's, th that's done all through your cellular provider over their internet service. The DNS lookups, however, are done through the WireGuard VPN through this cloud that we're setting up. If you were to change this value, and some people have requested it, that's why it's here, you could set it to all. And what that would do is instead of only DNS traffic going through the cloud, all of your traffic would be routed through the cloud. The one implication there is that there is often a charge for traffic leaving the cloud that you're setting up, the, the VPN service that you're setting up. Uh, all of the providers charge some amount of money for network traffic leaving their cloud, whether that's Azure, AWS, Google, or Oracle. Now, the one cool thing about Oracle is their free tier does offer a substantial amount of free uh, outbound traffic from the cloud. Do some research on how much that is. It might change over time. It's worth noting. I'm gonna leave it as DNS for now. I don't necessarily need all of my traffic going through the Oracle cloud. It's just not necessary. I'll leave it by default. Here's that DNS OVPN equal one. Again, this allows your home network to access the pie hole without using WireGuard. So if you have an, uh, a router at home that you want to point directly to the pie hole, you could do that as long as this is set to one. There are some others as well. Um, you'll want to note which of your region free tier compatible options there are. If you run this OCI tenancy ID command, Let's run this. And then we run 
the limits command right below it. This should tell us where and how many of our instances we can build and in what region and availability domain. So if you look at mine, my account, when I set up my Oracle account, it asked me for a region. I picked Ashburn and we can see that in Ashburn, to, um, the AD2 for Ashburn, I have an option for building two virtual machines of this size. And if we go back to Notepad, we can see I've, I'm using Ashburn and then the AD is two. All right, that's, that's pretty important. If you're using the free tier of Oracle, you'll need to set this. The instance shape, that just matches what the free tier offers. It's fine. It's not a huge instance. It doesn't need a lot of memory and it doesn't have a lot of memory. Also, occasionally, you'll need to look for an updated version of Ubuntu 18.04. Just like we're running Ubuntu 18.04 on Windows Subsystem Linux, the cloud service that we're running also uses Ubuntu. And occasionally, Oracle and Ubuntu will have an updated version. If we go to this URL, find minimal, Ubuntu 18.04 minimal. You can see it here. And then look for, let me expand it a little bit, but it says, click it, then use the OC ID of the image in your region. So if I find US Ashburn one here, I'll just control F it, US dash Ashburn one, there is the latest Ubuntu image. I'll copy it and paste it in. And that's actually the same. It hasn't been updated. They probably updated um, every couple of months, one to two months, you'll see an updated value here. You won't need to change it once you've deployed, but when you're setting this up for the first time, take a look at that website and grab the latest version. There are also some very uncommon variables. I don't need to change anything here. Everything's been set. This is all good to go. Let's save this file and close it. Head back to the readme and I'll scroll back down to the steps we're at now. So we've edited the vars file and saved it. We can now move on to deployment. I'll CD, I'll make sure that we're CD'd or changed directory into the OCI subfolder. We are. And then I'll initialize Terraform. This tells Terraform to download the Oracle specific code and any other code that it needs to run the project. Shouldn't take too long. And then we'll run Terraform apply with a reference to the variable file that we customized. This is really where the magic of Terraform comes in. It's going to read through the code of my project and determine what resources need to be built in the Oracle cloud, customized based on our variables. We get a plan. It says we're going to add 19 things. If you scroll up, you can see all of those things that Oracle, or I'm sorry, that Terraform will create in the Oracle cloud. I'll hit yes. And Terraform will begin building all of the resources. Uh, this will take a little bit. It's entirely dependent on Oracle building out those resources that Terraform tells it to. This can take several minutes. Let's be patient. I'll be back when it's done. Okay, Terraform has wrapped up the deployment of our resources. We can see there's some output now. Let's go back to the instructions. We note the output from Terraform, that's these green lines, and then we wait for the virtual machine to become ready. Ansible will set up the services for us. So we've worked a lot with Terraform, and if we scroll back up to the diagram, we can see it's Terraform plus Ansible. Terraform builds all our cloud resources, things like the network and firewall rules, the Ubuntu Linux virtual machine, and then Ansible will install and configure all of the services on the virtual machine. So that's things like Docker, the WireGuard container, the PyHole container, etc. We can watch that happen. If I scroll back down here, want to watch Ansible set up the virtual machine, you can connect via SSH. Let's do that. There's the output from Terraform to help us. The first time we connect will be prompted. I'll say yes. Now we can do two things, htop, H-T-O-P. This is kind of like an overview for what's happening on a Linux virtual machine or a Linux instance. You can see 
The machine is very busy. Both CPU cores are near 100% utilization. We've got quite a bit of memory usage, and we can see that DP KG or D package is running, and that's the installation tool for Ubuntu. It's installing Ansible right now. I'll control C to get out, and let's look at the README. We can also tail the cloud block log file. Now, I know because this instance just started up that cloud block hasn't started yet. Ansible is still being installed on this machine, but that's okay. I'm going to paste it in, and when the file gets created, the log file gets created, we'll start seeing the lines come across as Ansible completes. Okay, Ansible has a play recap and it has finished. We see zero failures. I'll control C out of the tail and exit. I'm gonna run the Terraform apply one more time because I want the outputs that we saw at the end. That'll take just a second. And we can now look at the PyHole web UI. Once Ansible's done, the PyHole is up and running and WireGuard files are ready for us to use. Let's start with the PyHole web UI. I'll copy this and open my browser. Let me turn off Dark Reader. Certificate invalid. That's okay. That's just because we have a self signed HTTPS certificate. Our connection is still encrypted. Let's continue. And I'll log in. The password is the password you set in your VARS file. Mine was change me one. And you're in your pie hole. Uh, the one thing I'll note, there is a single setting here to watch out for, and that's under DNS. If we look, we see these two custom IP addresses. They're actually the same IP. This is the container running our DNS over HTTPS service. If we look all the way back up, Cloudflare D, DNS over HTTPS, that's converting the PyHole DNS lookups that are not blocked into encrypted in transit over to our provider. Keep that in mind. You probably don't want to edit those. And we can also look at our WireGuard configuration files. Copy that. You'll need to be signed into your cloud account. Scroll down, there's the WireGuard folder. And we can see each of the peer configurations. There should be 20 here because that's what was set in our VARS file. Each one of these would be used for a VPN client. So if you have a phone, that might be peer one, a tablet, peer two, a laptop, peer three, etc. And if I click it, you can see the individual files. Now for things like the Windows client or a Mac client, you will probably need the .conf file, that's a text file. But for phones, tablets, etc., Android or iPhone, you'll likely want, where is it, download. There we go. The PNG file. If I open that up, I get a QR code. In the WireGuard app, there's an option to scan a QR code. Put your camera up to the screen, grab the QR code, and your VPN has been configured on your phone. Turn the VPN on, and you are now connected anywhere you go, whether you're at home, public Wi-Fi, on your cellular mobile provider. You'll be connected to your PyHole over the WireGuard VPN, and all of your DNS lookups will have that ad blocking protection. That's about it. Now, the one last thing I'll mention is this IP address, because we have the variable DNS underscore no VPN equal one, our home network can talk to this directly for DNS. That means you could go into your home router, set the DNS to this IP address, and you're able to talk to the pie hole directly in the traditional sense that you would if you had a pie hole running at home. That only works for your home network because we've set that up in the firewall that Terraform created for us. And the final thing we can do is Terraform destroy. If you're done with a project, you don't need this anymore. Replace Terraform apply with Terraform destroy and Terraform will generate a plan to delete all of the resources. It'll ask us if we want to confirm. I'm done with this project. I'll type in yes. And that is it. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Reach me on Discord. I'll put a link in the description if you have any issues or questions or ideas. You can also open something on GitHub. Take care.